All right, welcome everyone to the Continuous Medical Course Symposium Lecture Series. Today we're going to be discussing the GME uh, note and the Operational Medical Officer instruction that recently came out with Captain Beckman and Captain Schofer. Um, this, this series does occur every month. We have various lectures, so please stay on the lookout for next month's uh, lecture as well. Uh, take it away, Captains. Hey, thanks to everybody for joining us. I know that um, this is a hot topic for people, so we appreciate your time. Appreciate uh, Commander Inkalali setting this up. Uh, we'll uh, do our best to go through these 10 slides and then we'll answer questions uh, from everybody uh, doing the best we can. We've, this is our first time using this new setup here, so uh, so far it seems to be working good, fingers crossed. So I'm, I'm Captain Joel Schofer, I'm the Deputy uh, Chief of the Medical Corps, and uh, later on uh, for the latter half of these 10 slides, you'll hear Captain Beckman, the Navy GME Director. Hey, Jen, uh, can, you, uh, can you move to the second slide? Next slide, Jen. Not sure why it's not uh, why it's not changing on your screen. There you go. There you go. There. Now it is. Now we're, we're on oh. three on my screen. Just go to two if you can. No, you're fine. This is the way it is. You know. So here here are our, our goals for today. We're we're going to be reviewing uh, the OMO instruction at at a high level and trying to answer questions. And then we'll take a look at the new BUMED note that talks about the next upcoming cycle of graduate medical education. And, and we'll hit your guys' questions. Uh, next slide, if possible. So really, to talk about the new Operational Medical Officer Initiative, we're going to start by talking about the old way. So the old way was anyone without an operational specialty, and this could be interns or people that are already residency trained. If they wanted to be an undersea or dive medical officer or they wanted to do flight surgery training, they would apply to a selection board that meets concurrently with the GME selection board. If, if they wanted to uh, join the Fleet Marine Force or enter the surface community or, or the, some of the other smaller communities like Riverine and Seabees, they would just negotiate with the detailers for those billets. And that's the old way. And really, the quick summary of the new way, next slide, please, is that what we've really done is we have uh, brought, uh, made everybody the same. So we've brought FMF and Surface to the board as well. So really, the new way is that any physician without an operational specialty who's interested in one, whether it's UMO, flight surgery, FMF, or surface, is going to be applying to the selection board that will be held concurrently with the GME selection board. If your specialty already has operational billets, as we'll talk about down the line, uh, those can just continue to be negotiated. The best example is really on the green side with the Marine Corps, where they have a lot of specialties that already have green side billets, like emergency medicine anesthesia, general surgery, and undoubtedly some others. Uh, we're going to not talk in detail about the application um, instructions because they're in the instruction. I will tell you that we did get notice today that there are some links and email addresses that potentially are not working. I can guarantee you that I personally tested them uh, months ago while the instruction was in process. Um, but uh, I'll do so again, and, and if there's any ones that don't work, we'll, we'll get a corrected instruction out and uh, do our best to do that. Next slide, please. So the next, uh, really, the, the question I think at the top level is who should be applying to the new OMO selection board? And really, I would say all current interns need to apply because there really aren't any interns out there that I'm aware of that know that they're going to be going straight through into PGY2. So everybody's going to be need a landing spot. So all current interns should be applying to the OMO board and whatever operational specialties interests them. In addition, any residency trained physicians out there who have 
completed enough of their initial utilization tour to achieve board certification, which is obviously varies from specialty to specialty, but it's typically a minimum of one to three years. If they want to apply for an operational specialty, they would also apply to the board. This is consistent with what's been happening uh, for all the past years with UMO and flight surgery. It's just now that it's the same for FMF and surface. Next slide, please. So who should not apply? This is not a process for medical students. Medical students are just going to be doing the GME side of this. This is, uh, they do not apply for OMO. Uh, physicians who already have the operational specialty, uh, you know, they're already uh, a UMO, a flight surgeon, they have a surface pin or experience, they have an FMF ribbon or pin or experience would not uh, be applying because they could simply just uh, negotiate for orders with the detailers and specialty leaders. Uh, and again, like I talked about before, if you're in a specialty that already has billets in the community you want to go to, uh, emergency medicine, anesthesia, general surgery, otherwise, uh, most commonly this is going to be on the green side. You can just continue to negotiate for those billets. You don't have to apply to the OMO. Uh, I would say that probably people will apply and that's fine. Uh, we're just going to straighten it out. That's part of the reason why we're bringing it to the selection board level because it just gives us the control to be able to um, manage things tightly during this, this transition over the five years or so to straight through GME, which is really driving a lot of this. And at that point, we'll turn it over to Captain Beckman to, to go on to slide to, to the next slide where he's going to talk about the GME note. Greetings, everyone. This is Captain Beckman. So, uh, first items out of the out of, and this is all out of BMED note. Uh, so, the important dates. So, August 31st. That's the deadline to initiate an application. Uh, that is after that date, the ability to create an application in Mods goes away. Uh, you, you can adjust your application, including uh, submitting supporting documentation, uh, other application modifications. Uh, you know, make changes to the opt-out decision. I'll talk more about that in just a minute for those applying for straight through training uh, up until August or October 15th. But 31 August is the deadline to have initiated an application in MODS. Uh, week of 15 November is when, when the GMESB will convene and occur. 8 December is when we're going to re release the results. And then 7 January 22 is the deadline for acceptance for training for resident and fellow uh, selectees. Uh, next slide. So the training opportunities um, are identified in the BMED note for in an enclosures three to five. Uh, there's also the uh, a by site uh, sheet that is on the, available on the Corps Chiefs website, and that has the the goals uh, by uh, by site specifically. Uh, additionally, there are also, as Captain Schofer mentioned, you know, we're, st we're starting this transition to straight through uh, training, or mostly straight through training. Uh, so there are a limited number of straight through training opportunities for many specialties, and those are specified on Enclosure 3. Uh, we've gotten a couple of questions so far um, about uh, what specialties those are available for, and essentially, as long as they are identified on or in the BUMED note, whether they're in the table or mentioned in the footnote below the table in Enclosure 3, um, there are some, uh, some limited number of straight through training opportunities for those specialties. Um, as we continue to progress through this transition, um, we will be able to start putting goal numbers down there, um, as you see now. Uh, but right now, we just have the limited number um, so that we can maintain the uh, needed flexibility as we, as we start and uh, go through this process. Next slide. For the specialties with the straight through uh, training opportunities, those applying for PGY-1 will be considered for straight through training as well as internship only for their first choice specialty. Uh, if somebody does not wish to be considered for straight through training, they want to go do a GMO tour or something else, um, then you have to opt out and there's an option for that on the uh, on NMODS uh, check to indicate that you want to opt out. And again, that's, you can you have up until Octo October 15th for your decision to be final. Uh, so if you, you can check it or not check it, and if you change your mind, 
you know, between now and October 15th, you can adjust it as, as desired. For the second choice specialty, uh, everybody that's applying for PGY-1 will only be considered for internship year training. So, uh, so for your second, for the second choice specialty for PGY-1 applicants, or those applying for PGY-1, again, it's internship year uh, only consideration. Uh, we had, we did uh, now a couple other notes. Uh, we did discover or got some reports late yesterday afternoon about the the website that's in the BUMED note uh, for the GME website not working. Uh, we are in the middle at NML PDC of transit the IT transition uh, with Medcoy. So the the website uh, apparently migrated late yesterday afternoon. So we're sending that information out uh, so that you'll have the updated URL. We also have in that email. Uh, a second URL for mods. To, we've also gotten some reports of uh, difficulty with some, with the mods link that's in the that's in the BMED note. The one note about this additional mods uh, URL that uh, is available is that it's not Navy specific. So if if that second URL is used, you just have to make sure that you select the service correctly. Uh, and then a uh, couple other. Questions that have already come up uh, <clears throat> um, are reg with regards to uh, applying for the uh, for this for specialty for FTOS and NADS. Um, if somebody uh, if somebody is applying for FTOS or NADS and something that does not have a uh, a dedicated internship year, um, then they do need, they do need to apply for something that will have some type of internship. Uh, if they get selected for doing FTOS or NAD, but then they don't get selected for the residency, um, otherwise they could potentially end up uh, not training for a year and be in a leave without pay status. Uh, I think that's it for right now. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Commander Inkwawi and we'll go for questions and answers. Let me um, just say that th this is the last slide. So. What I've done is given you the email addresses for all of the special leaders that are going to be in charge of their communities for OMO. So if you have questions or uh, links aren't working, I would say they're your first resource. Uh, the GME uh, group email uh, is right there, uh, which ensures that, you know, if Captain Beckman's out of the office, somebody will get your, your question and respond. So I would encourage you to use that group email. But ultimately, uh, you know, you contact me or anyone in my in my office. Uh, my email's up there. I'm pretty easy to reach. Uh, we will we'll get you answers, get you connected with the right people. So uh, I do just want to hammer home on that last thing that Captain Beckman said because we did get some questions, and I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that medical students make is they fail to account for that possibility, although low, that they could get a one year deferment. So they all need to come up with some kind of plan and apply for some. Uh, internships uh, that they all could match into if they wind up getting a one-year deferment. That whole thing's really only relevant to medical students. So at this point, I think we'll just open it up to questions. Uh, I think we answered the ones we got on email already. Captain Beckman dealt with them. So, Commander EK, we'll we'll see what people how you want to handle this. Sounds good. Um, I, the Floor is open for any questions. For anyone that has microphone access, please feel free to um, unmute yourselves and start asking questions, or you can always raise your hand and I hopefully will be able to see that and call on you. Um, if you do not have microphone access, please feel free to type your question into the chat and I will, um, I will verbalize those for those who don't have microphone access. Is someone trying to ask a question? Because you're very, very quiet and I can't hear you. So this is Captain Beckman. I'll just jump in real quick. Uh, so I just, in the public chat, put the, uh, put the website URLs that I was just mentioning. The first one is for mods. The second one is the GME website. And then also we have weekly uh, assistance calls where we from uh, on Wednesdays from noon to one uh, 
uh, we're, we just, we're on the line, folks from the GME office are on the line for the entire hour, um, so people can feel free to call in uh, using that information and ask any questions they might have. And I put that in the uh, chat as well. Sir, I don't know if you'd want, I can put up the selection goals if you'd like, if you want to speak about that or the GME note. As I don't there's a bunch any of people. Either. There's a bunch of people typing questions into the chat. Ah, you can see them yes. typing. So yes, I see them now. So let, let's go with uh, Dr. Morrison Ponce's first question. If a PGY1 applicant is not selected for any GME and or OMO application, what is the process for assigning their next duty station? So I, I can handle that. Uh, I would say that they're going to get handled like they are now. You know, the detailers know how to write orders. Uh, nobody's going to be unemployed. And uh, I really find it hard to believe that if somebody who was currently an intern uh, applied for stuff, um, that unless there was some kind of physical qualification issue that they wouldn't get picked. But um, we do have a number of non-operational GMO billets that will still need to be filled. Uh, the number last time I looked was somewhere around 70 or 80. And I think they'll just be dealt with by the detailers on a case-by-case -case basis. And so Commander Fu is asking, um, she sees that Captain Leonard's email is attached, so if providers want to go to the service fleet, they should also apply to OMO. So if they already have a surface qual, basically a surface pin, have time with the surface force, then they would not need to apply to OMO. But if they don't and they want to, then yes, they would apply. And Captain Beckman, there's a question for you. Are current GMOs able to apply for PGY1 spot? Always, you don't have to. Get, you just talk to the. So the short answer, no. The current GMOs would apply for PGY2, and then if, if what they're applying for requires uh, some period of PGY1 rotations for whatever specialty they're interested in, then they would be they would do what's called a, a period of, of resiturn, um, and we can talk more about that with them depending on what their interests are and their program directors and the special leader would also be able to help with that information but no, they'd still be applying for PGY2. Captain Blickle texted does this mean that or does this mean that staff who don't apply for the OMO selection board will not be placed in surface or FMF billets? I would say the answer is no to that. I think that during this transition period to straight through GME, it's going to be approximately a five-year period. And until we see who applies uh, and what the, how the numbers shake out and who accepts what and the transition goes on, um, it's going to be interesting to see how it shakes out. I mean, our intention is to fill billets with volunteers. But like all things Navy and military, if there was a requirement and we don't have the enough people who have raised their hand. Uh, I know that the special leaders and the detailers know how to go grab people if they need to. So um, Commander Krasaniak is asking when, this is for you Captain Beckman, when might we expect to get more information or know when we will have hard numbers on the numbers of straight through positions? This is a huge recruiting factor. And having already started interviews, good candidates are not necessarily satisfied with we don't know yet. Um, I, there are a lot of there are a lot of factors that go into determining this. Uh, you know, this is the first year doing this, um, so I, I don't I don't have a solid answer. I mean, but it's greater it's you know greater than zero. Um, you know, I, I think probably in most cases it's you know it's a few, uh, but. I, I don't know if I can tell you when Commander Krizniak we're gonna have, we're gonna have the hard numbers. I mean, I have a I, I would say that you know the reason why we're being vague is because a, a real primary important factor here during this transition for Admiral Hancock is to make sure that we train the people returning from the fleet who are qualified for training, and until we see how many people are applying. Uh, that are currently out in the fleet and need to be accommodated and score high enough to match, uh, it's really essentially impossible to put out numbers. And so when are you guys going to know? You guys are going to know 
at the GME scoring board, uh, and that might need to be adjusted at the GME selection board, depending on how things go. But I really, I really don't think that there's any way to put numbers out ahead of time. Uh, and each different specialty is in a different scenario. We have one specialty in particular that I'll keep, I won't name, who I think is basically ready to make the transition now. And then we have some that are going to need the entire five years, if not more, and then we have everything in between. And I would just encourage people who are maybe not happy with the we don't know yet answer to realize that prior to this, the answer was zero. So more than zero is better than what it was before. Um, next question is from Commander Morrison Ponce. Um, for staff positions applying to OMO, are the selections binding or can they turn down selection and take traditional detailing orders? So it's just like it used to work for flight or dive. You apply and you don't necessarily have to accept it. Um, if the detailing cycle runs through its course and we don't have enough uh, volunteers to fill the requirements, uh, the special leaders and detailers will be reaching out to fill those requirements, although that's not really unique to this new process. So the intention is just like in the past, you could have declined to take flight or dive. You could now do the same thing for FMF or um, surface. And in fact, I expect a lot of people will apply to multiple. So they would only accept the, the one they want. Uh, next question, can PA or NPs apply for OMO? Uh, the answer is, uh, it's in the BUMED instruction. Nurse practitioners cannot. Uh, there are aviation PAs. Uh, that is not a new uh, new program. That is an old thing that was in the old instruction. Uh, but uh, the OMO process is purely, other than that, purely a medical core um, initiative. So uh, this is a GME question. For specialties without building internships, should we advise MS4s to place their desired specialty as their first choice and their PGY1 program as their second choice? For example, first choice anesthesia, second choice transitional year. Captain Beckman, you want to handle that one? Yes, I think that would that would be good. Um, and then just as a side note for Captain Chauffeur and Commander uh, in Kauai, um, apparently as part of this domain switching, my computer is about to be signed out and restarted. So you'll probably see me go away off the website, and I won't have any visibility on this, and I'll just stay on via the phone. Um, so I appreciate Captain Chauffeur continuing to read out the questions. Um, so back to answering the question. Um, yes, so yeah, they can. That would be that would be good uh, to do that. I mean, they could place if they wanted. If there was a second specialty they're interested in. I mean, they could do that. You know, if there was a different internship that they wanted to do for these for these straight through training, the specialties that don't have a dedicated internship year are in the process of working out. Uh, you know, what internships uh, those individuals would go into. Um, but if there's a specific internship that the, uh, the person is interested in, uh, then that would be a good thing for them to do is put that as their second choice, yes. Yeah, I would say that we, essentially what we're gonna be doing for people that are applying with their first choice for something that doesn't have an internship, we, we have a, we're gonna be working their internship matches in the background, so. Um, you know, if someone's applying for dermatology straight through, they're going to find out they match for dermatology straight through, let's say, for instance, in San Diego, and then they're going to find out, oh, I'm also matched in internship in San Diego of this particular flavor. So all that stuff's being worked out in the background. Uh, were the slides sent out? Uh, they will be. Uh, they were not sent out because we didn't have them ready until the, uh, basically 24 hours ago. Uh, but we will send them out. I'll, I'll put them on mccareer.org. I'll send them out in my updates. We'll, we'll get them out all the different ways we can. We'll put them out on the social media. Uh, is there an application link for OMO slash flight med application? Where can we find it? So all the links you need, subject to the recent reports that they are not working, um, although they were checked, um, is, is in the OMO instruction. And in addition, the specific special leaders uh, who are on the screen right now uh, can point you in the right direction if you're having trouble locating them. Uh, this one looks like a GME question. For current interns that are not selected to continue directly to PGY2 training and go out as a GMO, when they learn, can they apply for PG1 spots if there are no remaining PGY2 options because of 100% continuous training? 
that, well, that's part of the reason. So no, they should. No, they they would be applying for PGY two spots, um, and with the same caveat about potential res returnship as uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, no, they would still be applying for PGY two spots, and then that's part of the reason for the, this multi year transition process. So. Yeah, I, I would say that we we realize that the Air Force and Army did this, you know, fifteen years ago, and they still have non residency trained GMOs in the in the hundreds. We even even if we fast forward five six years and and we've got everybody all the medical students essentially applying for 100 percent continuous training, uh, we are always intend to accommodate the people that are coming back from the fleet if they score high enough and they match that we're going to be able to get them what they what they uh, match for. So that door is never going to completely close because we are even at the end of this we are going to have GMOs. Uh, GME question, uh, pretty, uh, I think, if an applicant is selected straight through, will they have to reapply for PGY2 like they did when they were pre-selects? And basically the answer is no, right, Captain Beckman? They're going to sail through. Yeah. Uh, is location selection like flight or dive where you don't find out right away? I know that it is a driving factor for people. People would rather be in a certain area rather than a specific type of OMO. Uh, that for, for, it's going to continue to work the way it does for flight or dive. And you are not going to be able to pick your location. You know, I'll only do FMF in a certain geographic region. It's going to be a negotiation between the special leader and the detailer and the member after the OMO process goes through. And I don't think that's any different than um, the other communities. I, I do think if you want to reach out to the special leaders and have conversations ahead of time about what opportunities exist, that's completely reasonable. For those of us who have already have an operational specialty like surface, is there a preference that we stay in our operational specialty when we rotate out of an MTF tour? Or is applying for flight or dive a good idea mid-career? I think it's tough to give specific recommendations. I think that, you know, the world is your oyster and you should, uh, you should pursue what you think is going to make you happy and give you a fulfilled career. I mean, there's opportunities in all of the operational communities. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, if you're already surface qualified applying for flight or dive. I mean, those communities are going to need people. Uh, I, I truly, and this is just my general recommendation, is that when you guys are applying for GME or you're applying for OMO, I, I just generally encourage people to apply for what they're interested in because come December, there's nothing wrong with having options. I don't know if you have any comments on that, Captain Beckman. It's mostly an OMO question. Yeah, no, no further comments. Uh, if you're currently a GMO with the FMF and are interested in RAM, you have to apply for OMO for flight surgery. Uh, that's by a Lieutenant Rodriguez. The answer is no. Um, if you're applying for RAM, uh, that's all you would need to do through uh, the GME process. Will there be an operational bonuses similar to the historic SWO department head bonus as additional recruitment incentive for operational medicine? Um, no, there's no additional bonuses being considered. There are definitely changes being considered. You know, that's an annual negotiation, but we're not. Uh, the, if you're, let's say you're an internist and then you go into an operational billet, you would still, assuming you, uh, continue being privileged in practicing, which is the requirement to get your specialty pay. You'd continue to get paid like the the specialty that you are. That you are. So, uh, Captain Drew, I did ban all 06 emergency physician comments, but I will read it. I'll violate my personal rule here. From an operational perspective, BUMED should consider allowing GMOs to apply for PGY-1 and EM and anesthesia. There are a lot of people in those specialties that pick EM and anesthesia because of their GMO experience. Well, I would say, and the Captain Beckman can comment on this, but I mean, we, we're essentially allowing them to be a resitern. I mean, they're, you know, if they haven't done, uh, if they need to do whatever portion of the internship they need to apply for, um, I honestly think that the current system meets what what you're saying captain drew but what do you think Captain beckman i agree and as i recall i don't have the exact 
language or the instruction in front of me, but I believe there's also a technicality about uh, individuals can only do one internship. Um, so that that partly limits the PGY-1 application uh, aspect. But yes, I mean, by applying for PGY-2 and needing to do some period of, of resiturn, I mean, even if it's 12 months, you know, that, that, that is a cat has happened before. Um, I mean, that will be accommodated, and they, it, there's nothing that precludes them from being able to do a particular specialty just because they need to do some period of PGY-1 time. Yeah, he, he's mentioning it's, it's a, you know, they're classified as PGY-2s, which results in complement increased requests, and I, I fully get that. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, this whole initiative should simplify things for the program directors out there. Uh, and, and after the transition, and we're largely training straight through, it should make things like this um, a lot less frequent than they are now. Uh, but, I mean, essentially the bottom line for me is that if, if you're a GMO, you're out in the fleet and you change your mind and you want to apply for a different specialty than you did your internship in, the opportunity will exist. But I, I do acknowledge for the program directors out there and special leaders that some of the way we do things in the, in the Navy makes things a little more difficult when it comes to compliments and things like that. I just, unless Captain Beckman, you have some wisdom you haven't shared with me yet. I don't, I don't see a way around that right now other than doing what we're doing, which is trying to get away from it. Correct. Uh, so this is a question. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to take first stab at this. This is a definite problem you and I have talked about. So general surgery trains 30 interns for 10 PGY2 spots. That's not reassuring for GMOs. If you want me to crack at that, I will. But if you want to start, you can. But I, I, I can't see the question. So what? Did... Well, it's just a comment about the pyramid. And so let me let me just start. So there are definitely some specialties, general surgery probably being at the front of the, the line that it's a pyramid, you know, there's there's interns and then there's not enough spots. Well, you know, that's got a, that pyramid's got a narrow. That's why we have a five-year transition. And uh, I would say too, that there will be some, uh, like we talked about, some of the residencies that don't have, um, currently have internships will, occupy, will, will take some of those spots. So for example, um, Radiology could have somebody that is interested, apply for straight through, is interested in interventional radiology and find out that they're a general surgery intern. Uh, same thing for derm. There's somebody that is applying for straight through derm and they're really interested in MOS. And so, uh, guess what? Uh, you match straight through uh, in San Diego for derm and you're a general surgery intern in San Diego. So, we get it. Uh, we're working on it. And, and that's why there's a five year transition period. Agreed. Anything to add, Captain Beckman? No, I, I agree. So Captain Sullivan, the PEED special leader, is asking, will non-specialty specific billet applications be handled differently now? I, I would say, um, having been talked to the detailers all the time and being a recovering detailer myself, um, a little bit, uh, it's still largely going to be the same way. But let me let me give you an example. Let's say uh, a captain select applies to an OMO to for OMO. Well, uh, if we if we pick them, we recognize that you know we don't want to put them in a lieutenant billet. So they would probably be be we're going to manage it on a case by case basis, and they would potentially be um, steered uh, via the detailers and special leaders to something that's in the non specialty specific billet list. Um, so I think that's probably the only change other than that. Uh, I know the detailers are working on it, but pretty soon they should come out with their, what they've historically called the non-specialty specific billet application process. Uh, let's see what we got here. Um, Commander Bergy says, so to recap, it sounds like the surface and FMF are changing to be like UMO in flight for locations. You used to be able to call the detailer and say, I want to stay in Southern California. We'll take either ship or FMF. Um, that seems like not an option anymore. You'd have to commit and then risk getting sent. I still think you can call detailers and talk to special leaders. I mean, I hear what you're saying, and that might be true. Uh, I, I do think that um, that's just the way it is. You know, uh, So I, I think I acknowledge that maybe there's a little less geographic certainty. But this is the process we're doing. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And I hear somebody laughing, and that's fine. <laughs> um, 
let's see, this one looks GME. Since occupational medicine and preventive medicine and RAM are all boarded under the American Board of Preventive Med, and all are two years with the possibility of challenging each other's boards, can the policy of only applying to two specialties be changed for these specialties? For example, it would be changed to ABPM with three locations on GME mods. I, I'll defer to Captain Beckman. I think we're, we're dealing with mods limitations. We've looked into this. Yeah, that's remarkably similar to a question I answered via email a couple of days ago um, or yesterday. Um, the answer is no. I mean, there's mods and it's, it's a, yes, it, there are, you know, multiple aspects to it, but short answer is no. And it's not, and ultimately it's not really necessary, but. Well, I mean, it's something we've definitely talked about. I mean, it's just not easy, believe it or not, to get there. So let's see. Uh, how with moving forward with allowing PGY3 graduates staying at MTFs after completion of residency, will we keep senior attendings involved and billeted to MTS for teaching with the required increase in junior attendings being staffed at an MTF to keep up with GME needs and keep a range of both junior attendings and senior attendings billeted to MTS? I got to be honest, I'm not, I'm not tracking on how what we're doing changes this. Does that make any sense to you, Kev Beckman? I'm not. Uh, I don't know that I, I'm trying to sign back in real quick. Um, I, I don't know that I understood what was being asked. Yeah, maybe maybe you can clarify. We'll, we'll you know, or feel, feel free to reach out to me on the individual level. Um, Let's see what we got here. Um, similar to general surgery for internal medicine, there will definitely be a period where we have many GMOs who want to do IM who are qualified, but with people going straight through, they will not they will not have spots to train. Is there a plan for training them during this transition, or do we expect that some of them will have to finish four years as GMO, then reapply for civilian residency once they leave the Navy? I, I would say that that statement's not true. I mean, there will definitely be a period where we have many GMOs who want to do IM who are qualified, but they won't have spots to train. I, I think definitely is a strong word. Uh, I think saying that there's not going to be spots to train is making an assumption. I can tell you for the one specialty last year that is, I think, pretty much ready to go to straight through. Uh, the board bent over backwards to accommodate all of the returning GMOs. So is there a plan for training them? Yeah. That's why we have a five-year transition. Um, in the current system we have, we have approximately 30% of GMOs who go out to the fleet uh, never come back for residency training. And I don't know what, you know, every year it changes. I don't know what the percentages will be down the line. And, and really the bottom line is for Admiral Hancock, he ha his top priority is to make sure that the returning GMOs get the training that they want. But even in our current system, it's not everybody. And some of those cases are voluntary, and some of those cases are not. You know, they just don't score high enough to match or some other situation. Um, so I, I doubt you'll have a whole lot to add to that, Captain Beckman, but you want to make a comment about making room for returning GMOs? Uh, <clears throat> no, 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 I agree. I mean, and, that, and that's part of the reason for the, the multi-year transition process, as we've talked, you know, as we, you mentioned earlier, and I think I mentioned earlier as well is to try and accommodate uh, everybody that's out in the fleet and that is competitive to be able to uh, to get into residency training. Okay. Uh, OMO question. What happens to people who wash out of the training programs like dive or flight? So uh, flight, uh, you know, aviation medical examiner exists. Uh, dive, they used to just lose those people, but we created or in, 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 are in the process of creating what we call the undersea medical examiner. So just like aviation medical examiner uh, is an option for people who uh, can't qualify as a flight surgeon, undersea medical examiner is now a thing that will exist uh, a year from now when we start the program uh, for people who uh, can't finish, uh, can't qualify as an undersea medical officer. Uh, the intention, though, being that people start out trying to do UMO, and then UME is a fallback. Uh, GME question, for competitive specialties that typically take their PGY-2s from the fleet, will opportunities increase for current PGY-1s to transition directly to those specialties? 
I mean, there will be opportunity. I'm not sure about increase. Um, for I mean, I, I would in general, I mean, look, over the next five years, we are moving to where the majority of people go straight through. Right. So um, the, the math, every year the math is complicated on how many people we are allowed to take from internship straight through into residency. Uh, trust me, you know, this is my baby here. And, and the, the more we let people go straight through, the, le the faster this process goes. So last year, the detailers were able to let us take more interns straight through than we were, were planning on and than we did in previous years. So in general, I think, you know, hey, the more people we take straight through, uh, the better. And that's what we're going to do increasingly over the next five years. But I think it's tough to make promises. Uh, Commander Paz from Rhoda. I've seen operational medical O4s get passed over for having several one-of-one -one EPs on ships uh, when compared with O4s that set up shop in a medsen and grad become EPs in their competitive group. How should we advise future medical corps officers for promotion planning with the OMO push? And will their chances to promote improve if they go to OpMed or should we recommend seashore rotation from OpMed to MTS? Well, I would say, you know, promotion boards change every year. Uh, precepts and convening orders are, are changed every year. But as the guy who reads them every year and posts all the changes uh, on my blog and, and disseminated other ways, I would say that every year the language gets stronger and stronger pushing toward operational. Uh, we uh, have made our medical core career plan consistent with uh, kind of like uh, if I had to summarize it, I would say y you want everyone optimally would come to their O5 board having been relevant in the operational world in some way. Uh, that doesn't mean everybody needs to do one of these OMOs. I think that, you know, for example, deploying on a hospital ship and getting your uh, global health AQD is also another way to be relevant. Uh, the um, language, and as the guy who's written it the last two years, the, the language on the slides and the promotion and the merit reorder language that the promotion boards review before uh, each promotion board, uh, we have placed more and more weight on operational medicine. Uh, but I, I do think it is very uh, difficult for promotion boards to just have kind of like blanket recommendations. I think at, at, at its most basic, the medical corps career pathway recommends alternating between an MTF or, or a clinic-based tour, NMRTC, NMRTU-based tour, and something else. And I think, you know, in addition to being operationally relevant by your O5 board, I would say alternating between a clinical tour and a non-clinical tour is also another quick summary of what our career pathway proposes. And that's what they look at uh, before the promotion boards, at, at the promotion boards. Uh, is it allowed, this is a GME question, is it allowed for current flight surgery UMO, GMO to reapply to GME during the first year of their first tour? That, that is ultimately determined by the time on station requirements. Um, I mean, people, can, people can apply, um, the detailers uh, screen the applications. Um, if there's somebody, if it's an application where the time on station requirement uh, isn't met, then more than likely uh, they're not going to be able to be selected. Um, so it, there are some potentialities for people being able to be selected. Um, so I would say if people are interested in something, uh, then they can apply. But I think by and large, the general answer is that most people would not be able to uh, get a waiver to uh, leave uh, their duty station early. Um, there is an occasional exception to that, but the by and large answer is going to be uh, no. Yeah, I mean, the, like you said, the, the real question to the answer is, are they allowed to apply? The answer is yes, and, and we just kind of figure it out. But I, I wouldn't get your hopes up if you haven't done your, your, you're only in your first year of your operational utilization tour. Uh, so here we have a clarification of the previous one that we didn't. So it was... Uh, Jacob Peterson, to clarify my prior question, we graduate eight to 10 PGY3 IM residents each year. If they are then 
need to stay at a large MTF for skills consolidation prior to doing an OMO tour. And we're sending more senior attendings to these OMO tours. Junior attendings will be filling billets at the MTF previously filled by more senior attendings. Will billets at MTFs increase to account for keeping these junior attendings at MTFs and also still allow for senior attendings who are interested in GME teaching to be billed at the MTF and provide senior leadership at the MTF? I'm not going to say that MTF billets are going to increase. I mean, I think we all realize we're not in that kind of environment. But I also don't see that anything we're doing is mandating, any of these changes we're talking about mandate that these IM graduates have to stay at a large MTF. I mean, they go to an IM billet uh, like they do now. And general internal medicine is a little bit of a pickle. I mean, they're generally very overmanned right now, not enough billets and too many folks. So I know there's a lot of scrambling going on and a lot of work to try to uh, make sure that the internists are given a, a, a tour and a billet that uh, but makes both them and the Navy happy. Um, so it's a challenging community right now. Uh, but I, I personally don't think that what we're doing here, and, and we could take it offline potentially, I, I, don't, I don't see it as a huge sea change for the way people are detailed right out of their residency. Uh, this is a GME question. Will there be more rad to nad spots for GMOs interested in returning to residency, but unavailable spots due to straight through PGY1s? So basically, are, are we going to use rad to nads more for returning GMOs? Uh, that, that is one of the options and one of the potential pathways. It depends on the, uh, the specialty and what demanding is because there are, uh, you know, there's a DOTI that governs the utilization of the NADS pathway. Um, so it would it would depend. I mean, so that but that is one of the potential pathways. One of the things that we're looking at. It'll just depend on how many people we have applying, what are the needs, um, and things like that. Yeah, they they also asked about FTOS too, right below. So yes, I mean, like Kat Beckman just mentioned, rad to nads and FTOS are FTOS is um, we don't have as many of those billets as we'd like. Uh, rad to nads. Um, is more of an option, but like Captain Beckman mentioned, we're, we're only allowed to use NADS deferment for things that we can't make enough of um, full-time in-service. So for example, like I'll use internal medicine because in general, we don't hit the capacity that's available for full-time in-service internal medicine uh, residency. We would not be able to use RAD to NADS to train people for general internal medicine. Uh, it would have to be something where we're at our capacity, uh, like emergency medicine or psych or something like that. The things that we traditionally use NADS for. Uh, so if you look at the RAD to NADS for the GME, we're encouraging it right now for anesthesia, emergency medicine, and general surgery. Um, how will the selection board medical corps handle physicians applying to OMO from undermanned specialties? Well, uh, the best we can. I mean, that's why we're bringing it to the board uh, and putting everybody in the room when we are there. Uh, we've got Admiral Hancock. We've got all the members of the board. We've got the special leaders. We've got the detailers. And like all things detailing and uh, Navy medicine, we will do our best to balance the needs of the physician and the needs of the Navy. I think it's tough to get more specific than that. Uh, let's see. Now they're quoting me. That can be dangerous. Captain Schofer mentioned a clinical slash non-clinical rotation for post-GME. Is that still true for fellowship trained providers? Rehab Hancock had mentioned these providers would likely stay at GME programs to train the next generation, like Top Gun style, but it was unclear when that would go into effect. Again, hard to get specific. I would say the longer your training is, the more specialized you are, the harder it is to make you. Uh, you know, the less likely it is that we're going to want you to go do an uh, OMO tour. Uh, but I do think that there's a lot of different ways to get promoted in the Navy. And uh, I, I think that uh, we put a lot of fellowship trained people out on the hospital ships. That's one thing I've already mentioned. Uh, but, you know, we do not want to close the door um, to anybody. You know, if anyone wants to apply for OMO, doesn't matter what specialty you are, go ahead. Uh, we'll do the best we can to, like we talked about before, balance the desires of the officer versus the needs of the Navy. 
Um, Captain Beckman, this is a GME question. Can you talk about FTOS, specifically length of service requirement extension? Essentially, what's your obligation when it comes to FTOS? So FTOS is, is generally two years for the first year and one year for each year after that. And then the other aspect is it gets served consecutively, not concurrently. Yeah, I would say the, the, the pluses of FTOS is you're getting your res you're getting paid by the Navy, your time counts toward retirement. Uh, the downside is the whole consecutive obligation. Uh, but um, you know, there's just some things we can't train in service and if you wanna if you wanna get trained in it, we, we use FTOS because that's what we have available. Is there any discussion of allowing a clinical ethics training okay. spot I given that? Here? Oh yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to interrupt for just a moment. Commander Buckling Coffee, the FMF specialty leader for everyone on the line, um, just had a quick comment if, if she could make it, if she could make, please. Yeah, yeah, I mean, nobody's jumping in, so yeah, absolutely. Hey, thanks, and sorry about that. I didn't want to jump in because you were on such a great role, sir. So thank you for allowing me to speak for a minute. I wanted to comment on the former questions about the geographical location versus the specialty for operational medicine. I think that what is important to recognize here is that this is professionalizing operational medicine. Being a FMF physician is not the same as being a surface physician. They are very different. So much like you wouldn't say, I can't decide if I want to do general surgery or family medicine. I'm going to wait and see who will send me where. Like we would all think that was asinine. Uh, that's the same way that we should start to look at these different operational fields as very different and very professionalized so that we are actually providing the fleet with what they need with officers that understand the needs of their specific specialties, not officers who wanted to be in San Diego so they went with the Marines or the surface. And so I just think that we need to really shift our paradigm to that and I, you know, I'm open to comment for that and open to discussion offline. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. And it really goes along the lines of what we talk about and what Admiral Hancock mentions is that we want everybody, we want people to have their clinical specialty and they want people to have their operational specialty. So, which I think is language that falls right in line with what you just said. And thank you for giving me a break. It's turned into a show for reading chat questions, but it seems like that's the most efficient way for people to put in questions. Um, is there any discussion of allowing a clinical ethics training spot given that DOD has stood up the Defense Medical Ethics Committee? First, I've heard of it. Uh, haven't heard of any clinical ethics training spot. Not sure if there's any kind of GME involved in that. So uh, if you want to email me offline and talk about it, we can. But unless Captain Beckman's aware of something that I'm not, I haven't heard of any talk about. No, I, I haven't. I haven't heard of anything. I mean, since it's a training spot, I mean, they would apply through the GMSB, uh, so they can be tracked and obligated service can be calculated and everything like that. But it would be handled. Through, I know it says clinical ethics, but I think that would be one of the ones that would go through the Corps Chief's office as a non-clinical uh, fellowship application type of thing. Yeah, and I know a lot of the non-clinical stuff requires. Uh, pre-selection sometimes like for example somebody was interested in the cdc epidemic investigation fellowship and we it turned out that they had already picked um but but if you want to email me offline we can we could talk about what's possible so this is a gme question um what's the typical number for of nads billets for anesthesia i know it depends on how many applicants so this may be challenging to answer it really doesn't depend on applicants it depends on graduates but i'll defer to kevin beckman Right. Um, it uh, it will capture. It depends on the number of graduates, uh, applicants too, because um, you know a variety of factors go into it. But um, it, so, but you know, we try to get, uh, especially you know, for for critical wartime specialty that is undermanned. Uh, you know, for all of those situations, you know, we'll try to get as many folks into training as we can. Uh, so you know, I'd say as, as as many as we can, you know, get into training again for all the critical uh, wartime specialties that are undermanned uh, and still you know meet the mission uh, from the other aspects as well so I know that's not yeah I, I I try to keep it simple I mean it really really down to the wire 
um, because what happens is well, we, we won't really won't, won't know how many medical students are graduating till the end, till very close. And then we, we just kind of do simple math. It's like number of medical students minus number of internships we need to fill full-time in-service in the military training programs equals number of NADS deferments that we're allowed to use. And then like Captain Beckman said, it, then they're kind of allocated among the specialties that we've advertised NADS opportunities for, which it looks like include anesthesia, emergency medicine, general surgery, neurosurgery, ortho, and psych. Um, hey, Commander and Chloe, is this thing going to shut us off at 1300? I don't know how this, how this thing works. I don't believe you know? so. No, this should be able to stay on for as long as we'd like. Well, I'm happy to keep taking questions. I don't know if Captain Beckman, do you have to go at 1300 or do you, can you stick around? No, I can stick around. Okay. Uh, then we'll keep going here. Um, Will there be a document outlining the number of flight surgery UMO FFF swim dough available billets similar to the annual GMESB note to let officers know what opportunities exist? I don't know if any of the, I mean, I know, you know, for flight surgery and UMO, the special leaders should have an idea. Um, I'm not sure. It's something we haven't talked about with the detailers. I don't know if they're on the line. If they're going to put out, you know, for the artists formerly known as GMO billets, they used to put out a list of what's available. Um, I would expect they'd probably continue to do that. I don't know if the detailers are on the line and can chime in, if Commander McNabb's on or Captain Smith or anybody. Yeah, this Give him a second. Yeah, Captain, sure. this is Captain Smith, repeat the question, please. Hey, you're, you're real quiet, just so you know. But they're just asking if you guys are going to put out, I think the question is really, are you guys going to put out lists of what billets are available, um, you know, in all the OMO communities so that people have some idea of what opportunities exist? It's kind of similar to what Commander McNabb would do with GMO billets. I'd say the, the answer is yes. Uh, and to get back, we're going to be releasing a non-specialty specific list which will include some of those traditional OMO, which will be matched by OMO. And then we will also submit lists uh, or advertise lists of uh, the typical operational billets that we have in the various specialties. Sounds great. Thanks for chiming in. So how will operational commands, patient care demands be met? Will board certified OMOs in hospital-based specialties or specialty clinics be expected to work in the typical GMO patient care setting? I would say that, you know, the devil's in the details. It depends on the command and where you're going. Uh, and uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that when we put people in these OMO billets that they are co-located with an MTF or a clinic that can support their practice. Uh, there's going to need to be some realization uh, from the operational commands that, uh, you know, upgrading the care they get from uh GMO to residency trained physicians requires that those residency trained physicians are going to need to maintain a broader set of skills and potentially have more time at the local MTF. Uh, but definitely, I, I don't think you want to apply for, uh, you're not going to apply for OMO expecting you're not going to be providing care to your operational unit. I mean, you are, you are definitely, that is definitely going to be part of, of your duties um, with some variability depending on, on where you wind up going. Uh, and then for fellowship trained clinicians who return to their operational specialties, will there be any baked in skill sustainment programs during the operational tour? A way for a GI doctor practice intermittently in GI during a flight tour. So yeah, same thing. We're, we're we just started the work to um, now that the GME note was signed and we're going to be moving to the straight through training. We've just started yesterday. We had the first conversations about how we're going to take these billets and start coding them for specialties. Uh, like I mentioned, we're going to make sure that the specialties that are coded for are coded for uh, or can be supported by the local MTF or clinic, NMRTC or NMTU. Um, but I, I, I re I'm going to sugarcoat it. You know, I recognize there is there are going to be some challenges. Could could a GI doc who goes OMO have, have a challenge um, getting what they would perceive to be enough time at the hospital? Uh, I mean, those are things we're going to have to work on. Uh, is someone trying to um, ask a question? I, I would say in general, right. okay, I would say in general for OMO, though, too, kind of like I mentioned already, the longer it takes to make you, the more specialized you are, 
uh, the less likely it is that you would find yourself in one of these tours. Uh, if you really look at the math, we don't have enough for everybody to do one. And so we wouldn't expect that everybody would wind up doing it. We don't have enough pillars. Uh, is there any, this is a GME question. Is there any discussion about GME selection board allowing pre-select applications for fellowship spots that rely on the civilian fellowship match process? When billets are approved the December before a fellowship starts, this precludes the normal application process that typically closes nine to 12 months beforehand. So I'll kick you, Captain Beckman. I, the pretty short easy answer. answer. The short, short answer is yes. Um, those that uh, the, pre, the need for pre-selects is conveyed by the specialty leaders when we do our training plan meeting in the uh, late March timeframe. Um, and that's how the, the things that need to be pre-selected are identified. Um, so if there are things that need to be uh, pre-selected, uh, you know, talk to your special talk to the special leader, make sure they're aware of that and they can communicate that to us during the uh, training plan meeting. Yeah, for example, on the current note, you know, we've got pre-select for Mohs surgery, we've got pre-select for five fellowships for general surgery, two for internal medicine. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them on there. There's a total of 24 training opportunities that are pre-selects that are all fellowship trained. So, I mean, like Captain Beckman mentioned, and we are surprised sometimes, you know, we find out that something required pre-select and, and we didn't, we weren't, we weren't aware or, or we weren't told. Um, and we will make those adjustments at the board if we can. Uh, will placing board certified specialists in flight surgery billets fundamentally change the flight surgeon slash squadron dynamic due to patient care requirements so these folks be able to embed themselves by committing 50% of their time to squadron business as is currently done? I think it'll be changed. Um, I think there's also potential for rank changes, although people frequently bring that up, especially with the Marines who are very rank centric. But I, I continue to assert that with the pathway being residency training, utilization tour, OMO tour, that a lot of these people uh, also because the longer it takes to make you, the less likely it is you'll wind up in one of these tours. So we're talking mid to shorter residencies for the most part that I think a lot of these people will still be O threes, no fours. Um, once people are going straight through and not spending that time out as a GMO, but yeah, it's going to change. Uh, things will change. And, and we, again, we recognize that, that there's going to be a lot of bumps in the road as we're doing this, which is why there's a, a five year period to make all these changes. And we are, have hit the bottom of our chat question. I don't know if anybody wants to chime in with anything. Um, give it a couple minutes for anything else to pop up. Also, if anyone wants to come off of mute, you can always ask your question vocally as well. There's nothing that says you can't talk as well. Looks like some people are typing. But I, I know people are going to start dropping off. So I just want to say, you know, thanks for everybody coming on here. This was a pretty popular session. Um, it looks like maybe Buckland Coffee still has her hand raised, if, uh, or maybe, maybe that was from before. Um, but, you know, questions, problems, concerns, the slides on the screen, contact us. Uh, we'll do our best we can to help you out. I'll also be posting uh, this video somewhere um, to be determined at a later date uh, for people to watch um, and listen to for anyone that wasn't able to come today. Yeah, they're just asking how to all that stuff. Yes, well, it seems like, um, yeah, and we'll get it out as best as we can. We'll put it everywhere that we know. I'm not sure if there's any more. Um, it says multiple users are typing. I'm going to give it a minute or two, but it seems like, right. um, yeah. Uh, if we are currently operational, would we have to apply to OMO to transition to a different community? Uh, if you do not wear the pin of the community, that you, if you don't have the experience, if you want to change communities, yes. Just like uh, if you were a UMO and you want to go to flight surgery in the old way, you would have to apply. Um, 
We do, if you read the note, we do take um, off-cycle non-GME selection board concurrent applications from people who are already residency trained. We'll do that any time. Uh, but we do encourage the majority of people to apply to the board because it gives us the most control over during this transition period. Is there a way to streamline or simplify the privileging process so physicians are able to more easily get back into the MTF to practice? Hey, I think that if you're a physician, you should never give up your privileges at the MTF. I mean, you know, when I was a detailer in Millington, Tennessee, and there was no emergency department, I was privileged in practicing at Portsmouth. Um, I, I think that, that you just never give it up. No matter where you are, you are privileged in practicing for many reasons at, at your MTF. Uh, is the expectation that surgeons headed to the OMO will be billed for shorter tours to protect against skill atrophy? Um, I would say it depends on most operational tours are two years. Um, we have not changed any tour links specific to this um, initiative. Um, so with the expectation that they that they're mostly two years and that you're practicing during your time, I would say we are not making a push to shorten tours. A program, this is a PGY-1, or uh, this is a, um, oh, hold on. This is maybe for both of us. Uh, can you further elaborate? If a program is selecting 100% of PGY-1 going through to PGY-2, well, I don't know that any program is doing that. And if GMO, flight surgery, UMO are unable to apply to PGY-1, what is the plan or intent for those operational docs to get back for residency? I mean, at the bottom line is they apply. And we will do what we can to accommodate them if they are qualified, score high enough to, to be selected. Do you agree, Captain Beckman? Absolutely. And just would add that, you know, and that that's you know, a big part of the reason for doing this over a multi-year period. Um, so, I mean, it's going to be a while before any specialty is selecting 100% you know, PGY-1 uh, applicants to go straight through, so, or people applying for PGY-1. To I mean, we, we might have one coming up, but again, you know, we could be surprised by an applicant from the fleet that we're not expecting, and if they're qualified, we, we you know, the board will do everything they can to accommodate them. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, would non-primary care oriented specialties, radiology, anesthesia be at a disadvantage to apply for an OMO tour where primary care skills would be required? Would these people need primary care refresher training before applying? I would say, uh, would they be at a disadvantage? Not necessarily. Uh, would they perhaps require uh, some additional work? Yeah, I mean... I'll use the example of when I was in Portsmouth, and there, you know, the person may even be on the line, but we had a, a dermatopathologist who is a SMO on an amphib. And that person uh, got privileged as a GMO, was working shifts in, in the emergency department in the fast track, and it took some time. We've also talked about um, with some of these uh, less clinical residency programs, uh, having people utilize some of their uh, elective time uh, to do clinical rotations um, as an option. Um, but again, like I talked about, um, we don't have enough spots for everyone to do one of these. So the expectation is not that every radiologist is going to do an OMO tour. Uh, I know Admiral Hancock's personal belief is that some of these things in these specialties that don't um, focus on primary care skills would be more pointed toward flight surgery and UMO because of the long training that they get, uh, you know, approximately, you know, months and months of training. Uh, so that is his personal opinion. Uh, I don't think that he envisions, you know, taking a radiologist and putting them in a primary care role. Um, we're not saying that can't happen, uh, but I think it's less likely. Uh, Commander West is saying, currently we have to wait for our operational privileging authority to approve our privileges before we can apply for privileges at the MTF. Okay. Um, I think, you know, I don't, I don't have any initiative to make that change, but I mean, I would just encourage you to do it. I guess we could talk offline. Maybe there's a way to make it better. 
If the Indian staff serving in a three-year overseas utilization tour be allowed to leave their tour early at two years if they get accepted for an OMO? Uh, I would say uh, we will handle everything on a case-by-case basis, but that's no different than um, you know someone who would apply for flight or dive. Uh, I wouldn't get their hopes up um, because ripping someone from an early, from an OCONUS tour is not something that makes a detailer smile, uh, but anything's possible. If they want to apply, they can, uh, but they'll have a purse flag and, and, and it'll get reviewed uh, in the room with all the detailers there. Uh, this is a GME question. Apologies if this was already covered. However, can you further elaborate on civilian and other training locations, specifically VA, DOD, civilian options, and MT and FTOS? So, kind of, kind of wide ranging. I'm not sure what's being asked um, specifically, but um, you know, when you apply and when you do your GME application in MOS, uh, there are location preferences uh, that are available to you. And you can identify if you would want to do uh, FTOS or, or NADS, uh, you know that type of thing in the uh, you know, in the location preferences. Um, the FTOS and NADS are are different. So uh, you know FTOS, as Captain Schofer mentioned previously, uh, you're getting paid benefits from the Navy. NADS is you're get, you're uh, not getting paid benefits from the Navy. Uh, you're getting that from wherever you're the institution where you're doing your training. Uh, the differences in the obligation, so um, so that's a, that's an important difference to keep in mind. And the VA slash other DoD settings. So if it's not essentially if it's not the NCC or uh, one of the Navy sites, uh, then it requires a FTOS billet. So just something to keep in mind because we do have a limited number of FTOS billets available. I'm not sure if that answers all the question, all the aspects of that question, but uh, that's what I have. Kevin, it's a thing. it's a pretty broad question. I, the only thing I would chip in there is that you know if we have the capability to, to train it in service, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna you know we're gonna preferentially use that over using civilian options. That's probably the only. Kind of goes in line with the previous stuff we talked about where we're not really using NADs. We're not allowed to use NADs for things that we can train. Um, look, we're getting, now we're getting plugs. Highly recommended becoming a flight surgeon. Look at that. Commander Krause's handing out $20 bills to get people to pump up flight surgery. Um, yeah. Highly recommended occupational medicine. It was I was a flight doc before completing OEM residency. We'll be double board certified this year and likely triple boarded next year. All right. Um, I think we're winding down here, so we'll give it another minute or two. But appreciate again, totally appreciate everyone's questions and engagement. Reach out to anybody with questions that are on the slide on the on the screen. And for anyone that didn't get their questions answered today, please don't hesitate to email Captain Schofer your questions or Captain Beckman. I'm sure both of them would be happy to answer any questions that you have. And my yeah, I can forward, I can I can very easily forward things to you for you know for you to handle. <laughs> you know, you know how that goes. Auto forward. Of course, sir. <laughs> of course, sir. Happy to answer anything. Hey, I'm one up on you on, on thank yous, Captain Beckman. I just got to thank you. You did not. I just like the record to reflect that. Noted. <laughs> if a designated flight surgeon who formerly served in a Navy squadron wants to take USMC flight surgery billet, will they have to apply to the FMF community? I would say no. They just contact the detailer. They already have wings and they're eligible for a flight surgery billet. There's still people typing, one of whom is an emergency physician, so. Sometimes it's hard to see. I, I don't know if they're going to, if they're typing at all, like maybe typing something else, or if they have to be typing into the public chat to see I, I mean, knowing Dr. Welpley, he's probably trying, he's probably typing with his elbows, so. <laughs> there, there he goes. For the GMO roadshow at MTFs, so I'm speaking about UMOs. Will someone be there to help me field the questions? I will invariably get about this stuff. 
Thank you, Captain Show, for boom, two to nothing. Thank yous uh, over Captain Beckman. Although I did tell him, make the comment about him typing with his elbows. Yes, we will get there. I don't know which one you're coming to, but I'll be at the one at Portsmouth. Uh, we will have someone from all of our offices at each road show. Uh, and I'll be at the one at Portsmouth and Lejeune and NCR, I believe. Excellent, sir. I'll be at Portsmouth. Thank you very much. And yes, sir, I, I can't get these crayons to punch the keys appropriately, so I don't know. Well, I know you do get confused when you try to communicate without crayons and construction paper, and, you know, hopefully you have a glue stick handy. And this is being recorded. <laughs> yes, it is. It is being recorded and will be publicly available for people to view. Great. Sorry, Welpley. I don't see anyone else typing. Um, so yes, I we're going to cut it. We're cutting it. An hour and 15 minutes. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Captain Schofer, Captain Beckman. Thank you. Thank you to both of you um, for this presentation and answering all these questions. As I said before, if your question was not answered, please don't hesitate to email the Corps Chief's office or Captain Beckman, of course. They'd, they'd be happy to answer any other questions that you may have or any one-on-one -on -one questions for your own personal um, um, career paths. Uh, we have these lectures every month, so please uh, join us next month for another installment of the Continuous Medical Course Symposium Lecture Series. Have a great afternoon and have a great weekend, everyone.